TEDx. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, what you see in this uh, picture uh, you're taking a look at is uh, my friend Fareed, my college buddy, and his uh, pregnant wife, Rana, and they're pregnant with twins, and everything uh, is happy. Uh, Next, what you see is uh, Rana, who perhaps uh, doesn't look as happy, and the reason is because uh, it's, uh, she's 24 weeks into her pregnancy, and she's begun to develop uh, big, serious uterine contractions. And in fact, uh, she had to stay at the hospital for 10 days so that they could put these sensors on her belly that monitored her uterine contractions, as well as the baby's uh, heart rate. And what you can imagine is that these big, clunky devices are uncomfortable, especially if she needs to go to the restroom, but another reason that Rana looks very uncomfortable is because there's no technology like this that exists for when she's home. So what happens after those 10 days when she goes home? What type of uh, information can she have to monitor the status of her pregnancy? So I began to take a look at this question, and at the heart of this question is the fact that if we think about biological systems, uh, like uh, the outside of our body, they're soft, curvilinear, and elastic, whereas the building blocks of electronic systems, electronic circuits, are semiconductor wafers, which are rigid, planar, and brittle. So it's about as polarizing as the state of affairs in politics right now in America. <laughs> so I became very interested to understand, is there any way that we can bridge this divide and develop a class of technologies that could help someone like Rana, both in the hospital and afterwards? I was very fortunate to have a colleague at the University of Illinois, John Rogers, who is beginning to develop a class of flexible electronics technologies. And as you can see, the procedure is remarkably simple. You take one of these semiconductor wafers and you peel off a very, very thin layer, and it turns out that anything, once it's thin enough, it's flexible. So you peel off this thin layer and you develop a procedure to mount it onto something that's naturally you know, stretchable, let's say like a piece of rubber or something like that. And so with John, I began to explore, wondering are there ways that we can augment this technology and really wet it to being able to monitor physiological signals on the surface of the skin. And after about three years of collaboration, we were able to establish a class of technologies that we call epidermal electronics. And what you see in this picture is an electronic circuit that's mounted right onto the surface of the skin. But equally as important is that this circuit can, can bend naturally with the skin. It's ultra thin and it feels basically, you, you don't feel the system on your body. And in fact, we can also make the system invisible to the observer. <laughs> And so what you see, what we did here, is we embedded this in, uh, inside of a temporary tattoo. And what you see is that there's a standard temporary tattoo. We mounted the electronics underneath it. And when we mount it onto the skin, all the observer sees is the standard temporary tattoo. And it can still withstand the natural deformations of the skin. Uh, next, you might be asking yourselves, well, what can this system do? And in short, the system is very multifunctional. It has a wireless antenna for transmission of information. You can also power the device wirelessly. And it also has a variety of different sensors that can uh, monitor mechanical information, temperature information, uh, electrical information, optical information, et cetera, et cetera. And I won't go into all the details of what this system can do, but let me point to a couple of examples that would be useful as it relates to Rana's pregnancy. And so if we think about Rana's uterine contractions, that's the process of the muscles uh, squeezing. And so we can pick up signals reflective of muscle contractions, as you see with this gen gentleman clenching his fist. And in addition, we can pick signals reflective of the electrical rhythms of the heart, which would be useful for both Rana's heartbeat as well as the heartbeat of the babies. So with that, what we got interested in doing is trying to replace that old picture of Rana at the hospital in 24 weeks where she's uncomfortable and she has nothing that she can do when she goes back home to monitor the status of her pregnancy, replace that with this ultra thin technology that's minim minimally obtrusive, picks up just as good of information and moreover she can use this also when she's at home. So we partnered with uh, Sandy Ramos from the Department of Reproductive Medicine here at UCSD, and we're putting these on pregnant moms. And in fact, we did that twice just this week. And uh, in addition, we're very fortunate that well, we're partnering with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation so that we're not only doing this locally, but we can get this to scale worldwide with the, this value add being that our systems in principle can transmit to smartphones in the developing world. Rana and Fareed were very fortunate that they were able to have two healthy young boys, Nikan and Aydin. But as many of us know, when you're pregnant with twins, primarily the twins are born prematurely. 
And what does a typical situation look like for a premature baby? It looks something like this picture here where the mom doesn't even have the opportunity uh, after birth to, to hold the baby in her arms because they have these sensors that are monitoring the babies, typically their heartbeat or their, uh, their lung function. And uh, so this is uh, daunting for the mother because she cannot hold the babies in her, in her arms. But it turns out that the state of affairs with premature babies is both good and bad. Doctors have been able to optimize treatment of the lungs and the heart, but now the bottleneck has become the brain. And just give you a couple of examples. Uh, for many babies that are born prematurely, uh, they have problems with stroke or ischemia uh, due to blood flow and the brain still developing. And also there's an increased likelihood of them having seizures. And if these are untreated, this can lead to mental retardation or an increased likelihood of having uh, epilepsy. And so there's a great need for this, and what's uh, even more so uh, uh, demanding is that there's only five hospitals in the country right now that have an intensive care unit for, for newborns that is dedicated to neurology. And so we're very fortunate in that uh, one of those hospitals is right here at UC San Diego. What we did is I partnered with the director of neonatal neurology, Mary J. Harbert, to try to attempt to see if there are ways that we can use these sensors to monitor these babies. And another point that I'd like to make, make, make that's important is that the typical state of care for these babies is that a, uh, a technician has to come in, apply these, uh, the typical sensors on the baby's head. As you see in the picture on the left, on the left side of my forehead, they have to pl apply conductive gel, monitor the electrical characteristics, and then only afterwards are they able to read this data. But guess what? Uh, these technicians only work Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, primarily. So what happens if a baby is seizing at midnight? So our plan is to see if we can replace that with our tattoos. And we ran very, one very simple experiment where we put, put both of the technologies on the same head, namely mine, and we wired them, both of them, into to the same amplification system to compare the quality of the signals. And what you see with the top four signals on the figure on the right is what was recorded using our standard uh, uh, clinical EEG, and on the bottom is what was recorded with the tattoos. The punchline being, you can't really see a difference. In fact, we gave this to a, a dedicated uh, EEG reader, and he couldn't tell a difference. So this holds great promise for, the, for these tattoos to replace the picture on the left with a picture that looks like uh, on the right. And so Mary J. Harbert and I have an active project right now at, the, at UC San Diego in the Rady Children's Hospital to turn this into reality. And so this tells a story about how these tattoos have been a part of Nikon and Idine's life from, uh, from development and to being a newborn. But what also excites me is opportunities of how these tattoos can perhaps affect their lives later on in the future. And in particular, let's imagine that we fast forward to when they're aging and there's a possibility that they could have cognitive deficits such as Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And that type of setting, you can imagine that suppose that I flashed some pictures in front of you, some of which were unfamiliar, and every once in a while I flashed a picture in front of you that was familiar. As these cognitive deficits uh, progress, your ability to distinguish those perhaps decreases. And so I was very fortunate to collaborate with Ricardo Gil de Costa, who's a, an expert cognitive neuroscience down the street at the Salk Institute, and we teamed up to develop a paradigm where we could test out if our tattoos mounted on the forehead could pick up brain signals reflective of that. And what you see on the picture on the left, if you look very carefully, there's actually one of those one of our systems on the forehead. It's very subtle, and that's the point. We, more so, we optimize this technology using cognitive neuroscience and electromagnetics techniques to see if we can really pinpoint those two different signals. And what you see on the figure on the right in the black is the brain response to unfamiliar, and the red corresponds to the brain response with familiar. So our ability to do this in a completely unobtrusive fashion holds great promise to be able to, to perhaps diagnose or to treat uh, the onset of cognitive disorders before they're measured behaviorally. And so with that, hopefully the glimpse of the picture that I'm providing to you is how we painted a picture of the circle of life of how these tattoos can be a part of Nikon and Ivine's life. And I imagine many of you in the audience have other ideas of how these technologies perhaps could benefit them. And we've thought about a couple of those ourselves. In light of the fact that we can pick up these brain signals that are reflective of cognition, uh, Ricardo and I began to explore a variety of other cognitive brain signals. And it turns out that if you integrate these together, uh, there's, there holds uh, very unique opportunities for us to think about the future of cognitive tutors within the context of education. And likewise, these cognitive signals can also be useful for the future of the entertainment industry. And in fact, there are novel ways in which you can wet these two together. 
But also, I imagine that many of you in the audience are thinking and scratching your heads about what could the adverse consequences of this technology be, in particular, privacy. If I have a mind-reading technology that can pick up on my cognition, will this in the future sort of negate my ability to, to freely wander about random things without being, hold, being held accountable legally, let's say? Um, in addition, Farid and Rana are great parents, but well, many, great, many great parents sometimes have this problem of being a little bit of a obsessive or compulsive when it comes to monitoring the status and the health of their baby. If we have this technology during pregnancy or on the babies, this could lead to unintended consequences where the doctors perhaps are, are overwhelmed with phone calls because the tattoo just said something might be wrong or this or that. So all of us need to be very careful about weighing uh, both the pros and cons of this technology. This technology, as with all others, can be used for both good and bad. And so you might, we might ask ourselves, how are we sort of thinking about this so that we tip the scales, so that the good outweighs the bad? So what we do in, in all our collaborations is we grab the group of students together and we make sure that the students uh, identify an important problem where there's not a clear right or wrong answer. We force half of the students to take one side of the, uh, of the issue, half the students to take the other side of the issue and argue it very carefully. The idea being that at some point as they are developing this technology, they are gonna be using this and they need to understand all of the possible consequences. And so that's one way in which we ourselves try to make sure that the people that we're training and building this technology understand all possible uses of this so that uh, the good outweighs the bad. But in addition, it's up to all of you in the audience and everyone watching here to think about how we can shape this technology for the good to outweigh the bad. And so in that regard, what I would encourage all of you to do is to email us at this address to tell us about your thoughts about possible uses of this unintended consequences so that we're all informed and this technology gets used for good. Thank you.